I have a territorial welcome that I also want to read for you today. Um, just getting Gary right on my go. I had a flashback to grade <laughs> eight just there. <laughs> Spiderweb show performance and Folda acknowledge that the venues for our activities today and the rest of the week are situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. As artists engaged with digital technologies that expand how time and space are perceived and experienced, we also acknowledge the many traditional territories across Turtle Island and the indigenous nations that predate European colonization of these lands. We look to the south and acknowledge the borders that were made by settlers who saw this land as empty. We look to the east where the Beotuk nation was decimated. We look to the west and acknowledge our ancestors' element efforts to eliminate indigenous people using hunger, disease, cruelty, and violence. We look to the north where the land itself softens under the effects of consumerism. We acknowledge that the digital tools that we use daily to communicate, <coughs> to make our art, and to bring you all here today are privileges that are not available to many rural and indigenous communities across Turtle Island. We consider our role in reconciliation and we ask you to do the same. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Wheeler. I'm the artistic director of Spiderwood Show. My name is Adrian Wong. I am the festival director and co-curator, and there's one person missing today. And that's Sarah Stanley, Sarah Garton Stanley. Uh, many of you may know her. She has been uh, just as big a part as, as, as us putting this festival together. She's not here today because she's opening a rather large show at the Luminato Festival called Out the Window, but she'll be here later in the festival. But just to acknowledge that kind of for better, for worse, whatever you see is the three of us uh, made that happen for together. For better, for better. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> mostly, mostly I hope for better. Um, Spiderweb Show um, started, um, the genesis of Spiderweb Show was a dramaturgical question, which was, what is the state of Canadian theatre now? And it was an aspirational question. Obviously, you can't really ever answer that question because now is changing and it's now and then it's now and it's now. So you never really know the answer to that question. And uh, over the past five years, we found a lot of ways into trying to answer that question. So we've had um, podcasts, we've had a magazine, we've, had, we've invented a technology, we've done different experiments with how to use the internet, and eventually all of those experiments drove us to create this festival. And so we really see Folda as another attempt to answer the question, what is the state of Canadian theatre now, and now being the digital era. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of other people that have been really important to the creation of Spiderweb Show. Obviously, the three of us have, have been a, um, in a leadership role, but uh, over the five years, <coughs> Laurel Green, Christine Quintana, Alison Bowie, Joel Adria, Camila Diaz Varela, and Catherine Mackay have all uh, contributed significant efforts to getting us here. And I would also throw in the over 200 artists across Canada who have written for our magazine over the last five years. Um, and I just wanted to mention kind of what are we doing here? We ended up in Kingston. Um, none of us were from Kingston when we started this project five years ago. <laughs> well, and, Sarah. Well, sure. <laughs> that's so funny. I mean, she has a house She here. does have a house here. She sleeps here every so often. And, and yes, and sometimes she lays her head here. Um, but I think, you know, she committed more to being here. And obviously, I, I've moved here. You're here now. And it really revolves around this idea that we would like to create an arts organization that can provide the participants with a reasonable standard of living and a reasonable life. And that this is a real challenge to us as artists that uh, <coughs> success seems embedded in 80 hour weeks and poor nutrition and low wages. And uh, that we've come here to try to build something that is going to create um, great art. Um, and if not great art, great experiments, great attempts at art. Uh, and, and that the people involved can perhaps live um, wholesome and fulsome lives. And so just wanted to mention that that's really embedded in the core of what we're trying to do here, actually. Also part of the core of what we're doing here at the festival is showing work at multiple stages of development. So you're seeing things that are alpha stage, which are like first experiments. Uh, those are, you know, anybody's guess whether they're going to work or not. They might, they might not. <laughs> But those, we know as artists that those first steps are critical to getting to the next step. Uh, so that's one of the things we really wanted to do is give artists the support 
to try things, to fail, uh, and to bring things back multiple years. So you may see something in an alpha stage this year that you'll see next season, next year, because we'll be back next year, bring all your friends, um, <laughs> but uh, in a more fulsome state. Um, and we're not here because we think digital is awesome and we think everybody should move into the digital realm. We're actually here because digital is here and it's changing the way that people are seeing art, are experiencing art, it's changing their expectations of what happens when they experience art and engage with ideas. And we as a community need to start, not to start, I shouldn't say it like that. We, uh, we want to provide opportunities to grapple with that, to see what does that mean to live performance. Great. Um, I also just want to mention uh, all of our wonderful team members. You can kind of tell them, many of them are wearing folded t-shirts, but I just want to give them a shout out. When I say your name, you can put up your hand so they know who you are. So Jeff McGilton is our associate producer. Katie Reddy Walters is a volunteer and outreach coordinator. Madison Limer, transportation, food, and accommodation. It's a very full file that Madison is handling. Uh, Nassim Loloi is our videographer. Uh, Mariah Horner is our digital content producer and she's also our Metcalf Foundation intern for the year. Uh, Remington North is the festival technical director and production manager. Clayton Baraniak is our access coordinator and Bridget Gohuli is the festival producer. I think she's managing the table up there but you probably met Bridget on your way in. That's right. So the festival itself is an experiment. I would say that we are in alpha stage and you are our test users. One of the experiments <laughs> we're running is by is running the festival off of Slack. All festival communications are off Slack. I know that there are some who stand in resistance to that <laughs> technology, and that is okay. But just know that if you need somebody quickly, you can message all of us who are on the team through Slack. Uh, the daily schedules will be put out in that way. If you're not using Slack, you can find somebody who is and ask them a question and say, get yeah. me Adrian. And, and I think just to <laughs> communicate the, the motivation for that, uh, what is a digital festival for us that stretched into what is the infrastructure to the festival as well? And how could we create all the tools that one needs for a festival without printing a whole bunch of things on paper? Mm -hmm. And that we found that Slack was the singular solution that allowed us to avoid all of the paper that usually comes. You'll notice that normally when you come to a festival, you get a big kind of duotang with a whole bunch of stuff in it. And, and all you got is this. And that was very intentional because we feel like uh, everything that you would get in that package you can find on our Slack channel. But we still printed out our notes. We did. <laughs> so you see, we're on the cusp of change. But, <laughs> but unable to fully commit. It's, it's about light, though, because I've seen so many people get up in front of people before and pull out their nice lights on their cell phone, and then if you're in a theater like this, it's washed out, and then yeah, you're yeah, in a sure. lot of trouble. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Um, Wanted to mention a couple other things. Festival Bar. The Alibi is our festival bar. A bunch of us went there last night. Very nice. Uh, and so at the end of each night, a trolley comes here and goes straight to the Alibi. So if you want to uh, have a beer, it's super easy. You just literally need to get on the trolley and it deposits you at the bar. Yes. They have food at night. There is a menu, so you can have your late night snacks. And um, the other um, kind of uh, housekeeping items, just to bring up up to date, is uh, every day there's a schedule. It will come out on Slack the day before. The meal times are listed in the schedule. Trolleys take us between anything. So if you see on anything in the schedule, it's like, oh, that's not here. There is some sort of transport organized to take you there. It's almost always a trolley, I believe. Uh, but or you're help. You're welcome to make it there on your own. You're not obliged to take the trolley. But just to know that if it's not here, we have a plan to get you there. Mm -hmm. Um, and today there is a bit of a complication in that uh, uh, we have Facing the Street, which is a walking tour with podcasts uh, in the late afternoon, early evening, and some of you will be booked for good things to do during that. And so if you have a good things to do slot, the trolley will take you up to the uh, Facing the Street after you've had your good things to do slot. So we've thought about that, just if you're worried about having that conflict in your schedule. Don't worry. Oh, this is me. Yes. If you're looking for washrooms and you haven't found them already, they're out to the left, end of the hall there. Um, you may have noticed that there are no breaks scheduled into the schedule, and that's because Sarah Stanley made it. <laughs> She's not joking. No, but seriously. Um, all of our sessions... Did you get that, Ramona? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All of our sessions are relaxed sessions, so the doors are going to stay open, the house lights are going to stay up. If you need to take a break and take care of water, 
self-care, get some <coughs> sunshine, you need to get out of the room, please do. Take care of yourselves, take the breaks that you need to take. For those who will be speaking up on, uh, <coughs> on in the different conversations, it's not personal. It's not about you, it's about our, our people and we can create that space for each other where we can take care of ourselves. And the times outlined for each session are soft targets. If we are finding that the conversation is coming to a natural close, then I will end that and we can go and stretch our legs. If we feel like we're moving past our time, there are we do have a little bit of leniency, but with our trolley schedules, there will be times where I may have to like call it to a close and head out to catch the bus. Great. Uh, of course, uh, I should mention all the people that have made this possible. It obviously takes, uh, takes a village. And so um, here's some people in the village who have money and resources and, and believed in this project. Uh, first to the Isabel Bader Center uh, for the Performing Arts for making Spiderweb Show uh, artists in residence this year. Um, the Queen's uh, University Dance School of Music and Drama. Also Queen's University's Department of Film and Media. Uh, Plank, who is our digital and graphic partner. So awesome, Plank. Not only built our website, but they designed our logo. And I'm really happy with how the whole thing works together. Uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage, Canada Council for the Arts, Canada Summer Jobs, the City of Kingston, the Metcalf Foundation, the National Arts Centre, and you for being here with us today. Yes, so good. You can even contribute more if you're so inclined. We have an Indiegogo, which you will find on Slack. Um, <laughs> and there's t-shirts and all kinds of stuff that yeah, you can there get. Are of there are levels of There are levels of rewards. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to get us off stage, I just want to say hi to our friends on the internet and thank you to our friends from HowlRound who are streaming this conversation and the next one to the world. And uh, I think at Spiderweb Show, we feel a deep affinity to the HowlRound organization as kind of an American version of what we're doing. And uh, it's really nice to have you here and, and broadcasting this first thing to the internet. Thank, thank you. Thank you. On with the show. On with the show. Okay. The show. So that didn't take too long. All right, so I'm going to introduce our first conversationalists today. I'm going to move my computer so that they have a place to sit. <laughs> I'm not going to read the full bio. The bios are all on the website. But I want to introduce Andrew DeCruz, the executive producer of CBC Arts and the Exhibitionists. Andrew, come on up. And I want to introduce Donna Michelle St. Bernard, playwright, activist, mover and shaker, award-winning playwright. Come on in. I arrived. You arrived. Everything is here. I mean, okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Hi. So nice to meet you. you. Are you on Slack? I'm. I'm not. No, sorry. No. <laughs> so we were actually just trying to figure out who's starting, and it looks like it's me because I see some logos. So that means me. Um, so hi. Uh, our conversation is about disruption. Um, and I think there's a lot of different ways that we're going to take that. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about how it applies to what we do, what I do, and uh, we will go from there. And then mm. we'll hear about some interesting things from you as well. I am very excited. So, I'm Andrew DeCruz. I am the executive producer of CBC Arts and CBC Arts Exhibitionists, um, which is a TV show. And CBC Arts is a digital content vertical, to use the horrible jargon. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about what we are, why we are, why we do what we do, and how it might be different from what CBC has traditionally done uh, with the arts. So I'm going to start by asking who here remembers the TV show Opening Night? Anyone here? We got one. We got one. Cool. So it ran from 2000 to 2007. It was a, you know, a primetime broadcast show on CBC, and it really shone like a spotlight on the capital A arts, you know, classical music, ballet, um, theater, lots of performance, lots of, you know, feature documentary, that kind of thing. And it had a pretty small but pretty loyal audience. I was part of that audience. I was sad, like a lot of people were sad in 2007 when that show ended. Shows end. Um, and for a while, the arts program at CBC was mostly, you know, we had a lot of great radio shows, we had a lot of good news stories we didn't really have a focused strategy around the arts. In 2015, we launched CBC Arts. You know, it sounds like a thing that's always existed. It just sounds like your public broadcaster and the word arts together. But this version of CBC Arts was an attempt to 
do something a little different and attempt to make arts content and arts programming that was really catered to the way that we saw people were actually consuming it these days. So basically make arts content for, I don't know, what screen do you look at most of the time? Your phone, right? Your laptop, probably your phone. If you're a turbo nerd, maybe one of these things, but like no one actually uses them but me. Um, and so that is what we did. And I wanna show you on the next slide, Adrian. Yay. Um, if hopefully this will play and hopefully we'll have audio a little bit about what we do. Uh, oh no. Really? Well, I won't show you that. It's our really sweet trailer. Um, uh, yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Can we give it one more try? Is yeah. it something I can find online? Uh, yeah, but it might take a sec, so okay. don't worry about it. Um, but it's a, imagine a really cool trailer with lots of amazing imagery, <laughs> disruptive artists. Um, you so know what, can we just all react to the trailer? Yeah. yeah. Oh. 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 And most of all, our awesome host, Amanda Paris, who is not that lovely lady there, is a different person um, and is really cool and you would have been all charmed by her. Sadly, you cannot be charmed by her right now. Um, let's continue, shall we? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Here's some real quick mission statement ease. So we're a conduit to bring Canadians closer to the most interesting and inspiring and shareable art and artists. And I'm going to talk about what that all means in a sec. So let's keep going. Here are our values. We are fresh. We are diverse, both in our staffing and in our content. We are distinct. We are irreverent. And we are where the audience lives. So here is a little bit about what we make. And there are Actually, I think no more videos that we need to watch, so we should be good. Um, next. So what do we do? We make videos. So this uh, right here is from a piece uh, from a series we did called The Move. It is you know, six dancers tell us about the move that changed their life. Like they first realized, you know, oh, I could be a dancer, or I, I figured out this thing that no one has ever done before. And this is a, a young um, Baranatiam dancer, uh, and she had a really beautiful, lovely story. And so a uh, really talented producer on my team you know, shot this five-ish minute profile video of her. But as we know, disruption, things are, people don't consume stories the way they used to. Five minutes sounds pretty short, but really people watch videos that are like 60 seconds. And so we make a version of this that goes on Facebook that's 60 seconds long and it's optimized for people who are just doing this thing, they're scrolling. And we want to stop their scrolling. We want them to be able to watch it. Their sound is probably off. We want them to be able to understand what's happening without sound on. So that's kind of what we do to our videos sometimes. And if you go to the next slide, we also do this thing, which is what you guys probably look at all the time. We make Instagram stories out of them. So we went from like a five minute video, which in the old days might have been like a 45 minute profile. So five minute video, we cut it down to a one minute thing, and then we do these Instagram stories, which are like, I don't know, 30 seconds of content maybe. And what we're doing is we are where the audience lives. So we know that this is not the full story about her. Hopefully the people will swipe up and learn a lot more about her. And her story is really beautiful and her dancing is just sublime, particularly her facial expressions. Um, but, uh, but we know that we have to also be where people are actually consuming this stuff. And we're not just there because we're trying to like grab a slice of their attention or whatever. We're there because we know people actually want to engage with this kind of content. And, you know, can't often do it because most people are not going to be in Toronto during the two weeks a year that she might be performing, or more, but still. All right, uh, next slide. We also make videos in other ways. So we have a great team, it's a very small team. We also work with freelancers across the country. We have a small army that's making incredible videos for us. This is one of them. Um, it's a part of a series that we did called Canada is a Drag, and you can kind of guess what it's probably about. Um, we saw that there was this incredible appetite for RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't know, who, anyone here watch RuPaul's Drag Race? Yes, one, two, three, four, a few. Um, it's super popular for lots of reasons, um, and heck knows we're not gonna be able to do the same kind of thing in Canada, but we know that there's all kinds of incredible drag performers in Canada, and very few of them have actually had like high and high production video pieces made about them of any kind. And, you know, a lot of them are legends in their cities. They, they are known by everyone. The, you know, they have this incredible history. They can tell you about their city. And so we thought, you know, drag performers were a great lens to explore that. This series came as a drag. Um, 
Uh, do we have, yes, our drag performers are sashaying into the spotlight. This one is Lourdes the Merry Virgin from Edmonton, who was wearing this unbelievable Oilers jersey <laughs> fishnet combo, which is like my favorite thumbnail image of all time. Um, we keep going. We make articles. This is an article. This is an article about uh, uh, a public art project. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, you put a good headline on it, you can scroll through it. It gives you kind of a taste of some cool art thing that you might want to go learn more about later or experience for yourself in person. Um, next. And we also make, oh yeah, that thing called TV shows. So on the left there is CBC Arts Exhibitionist. There is Amanda Paris, who is a little static here. She's not talking to you as she might have been earlier. Um, but uh, the way this TV show works is we make all these cool videos, and then Amanda, on a weekly basis, takes you through a curated selection of them. These are the ones that are, you know, they, we take four or five that fit one theme, and, and Amanda is your host who brings you through it. So what we are disrupting here is the conventional model of TV. I've worked on lots of TV shows before where you make a TV show, you cut it up in bits, and you feed those bits to the internet. We are doing the opposite. We are making things for the internet, and then we are pacing them together, pacing them together, I don't know, bad metaphor, uh, with Amanda as your guide to this incredible world. Um, there are some other great TV shows that we also put out, but I won't go through them now. Um, we also do live events. Um, this is the Secret Path, uh, which was the Gord Downey um, collaboration about the story of Chaney Wenjack, uh, the animated film. After the film uh, played, we had this conversation uh, called The Road to Reconciliation, and it was talking, these were uh, different indigenous writers and artists, and they were just talking about the artist's responsibility or job, or if there is such a thing with regard to this question of reconciliation. And what I really loved about it, it was a live event on stage. It was at the CBC Broadcasting Center at the Glen Gould uh, in Toronto. But we had a real kind of beautiful dialogue with people online, too. It was live streamed. It was live streamed. Hi, internet. Um, it was live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. And you know, like you do a lot of these things, we had people reading the comments that were coming in from the internet. And usually they're garbage. There's a lot of really horrible comments. <laughs> And like it, it breaks my heart, especially on indigenous stories, the horrible, disgusting comments that we get. Um, but on this, we had a real, genuine, beautiful interaction where people were sharing their own personal stories of survivors from residential school or children of them, and having a like an actual gen like asking really good questions, and then having this really esteemed panel, you know, kind of respond in the moment. And I really was quite inspired by that. And I can say that because. We did this before I was officially working on CBC Art, so I was just part of the audience, and I was, you know, just really moved by it. So you know, I'm not just tooting my own horn. Um, continuing, um, and then just a selection of some other uh, cool things we do. Artists, my country is a is a digital series of uh, sort of mid career artists who all come from different places around the world, have come to Canada, so immigrants, refugee stories. One person is an indigenous artist who feels like moving to Montreal was like immigrating to her, uh, coming from her own community. Um, at the bottom there is a series we do called Creative Minds of Talks. On the left are three images from an episode that a partnership we did with the Winnipeg Art Gallery on the show that they, they had called Insurgents Resurgence. Is there anyone from Winnipeg here? No, it was the largest, uh, oh, Winnipeg, um, the largest uh, show of contemporary indigenous art in Canada. And so we, we went there into a special on location uh, sort of looking at each of those artists and continuing. And like I said, we are where the audience lives, and the audience lives on all these, these little screens. So middle one's our website, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah. Um, and we also, you know, you can watch everything online on our website. So a digital first approach. This is like flipping the way that we do TV. Instead of building things around television, we're building things around what people actually spend their time doing. That was, my boss took this photo on the bus and she said so like every single person is staring at their phone. And, you know, for good and ill, I think it's both. Um, but if we don't engage with that reality, then you know, we're missing an opportunity and we're also you know, not doing a service to the artists who we're trying to shine a spotlight on. Um, we find that there's a need to nurture and grow younger audiences and creators. This is like a thing that CBC is obsessed with because most of our core audience is a bit older and that's fine and that's great and we're really happy to have them, but we also need to know that people you know, my age and younger can also find a home at their public broadcaster, which they're paying for. So we're really 
you know, concerned to be serving those audiences too. And then this last thing, um, when we launched CBC Arts, we didn't really know what's the mix of content that's going to resonate with people. We did a lot of different things. We tried, we threw a lot of things against the wall, and blessedly, some of the things that worked really well were the things that really engaged with diverse communities that were underrepresented. I think the reason that we did that is that we had so many people on our team who were from those communities who could bring those stories. We, my senior producer is uh, is of Filipino descent, and as a result, has like brought this unbelievable, amazing overrepresentation of Filipino Canadian stories, which was really a thing on Canadian TV, and we're really happy. And as a result, like the th the second most popular uh, you know city for our Facebook page is Manila, which is great for CBC Arts. Like, <laughs> I'm thrilled. But that, I mean, it's not true anymore, but it was true in season one, and like I'm thrilled that that's the case. Um, and so yeah, we found that not only is there you know there is we have a responsibility to serve these underserved communities, and I absolutely believe that as a person who is from such a community. But I also think it's a digital is this unbelievable opportunity to do so because, you know, the means of production are cheaper, and we can really try and reach out and have more organic partnerships with them. And so the last thing I want to have here is this next slide. This quote here. This is. In survey after survey, in research after research from big arts institutions in Canada, this is like the number one reason why people don't engage with the arts. I didn't think this was for someone like me. And I think what we're finding is as we turn our focus on all these different underserved communities, whether it's drag performers, whether it's the Filipino community, we find, oh, if you, I mean, it's the most basic thing ever. If you see someone who looks kind of like you, you might start to think, oh, maybe this is for someone like me and sort of pull people into this larger arts conversation. So I think that's all that I wanted to say. I had some lessons. I'm not going to go through them all. But uh, I think the, 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 most, uh, the most important things here are serve the communities that need you and listen, publish, iterate, repeat. Every six months, everything that I know about the internet changes and is wrong. And we have to try it again and try a new thing. And so that's why the last point, be humble. Because the second that you think that you know how to do digital, you're you're dead. So, yeah, that's me. Awesome, thank you. I just need to write down, yeah. be of service to the awesome. Yeah, I mean, not everything we do is serious, weighty topics. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's really beautiful art that's spinning, and that will give you a second of not thinking about certain presidents who you don't want to think about because you're thinking about them every other second of your day. So be awesome. You know, it, there are, there are, it's a real service to people, I think. Thank you for your service. Uh, well, you know. um, cool. I'm going to pretend you didn't just tell us a bunch of stuff and talk about myself now. Yeah. <laughs> I hate talking about myself. This is, you do that. Yeah, yeah, this is me at a dinner party. That's fascinating. So what I'm working on. <laughs> um, so I, um, this is a, an interesting place for me to be because for me, technology in my practice is disruption. Um, just the, the suggestion of it, I have the best face for anyone who suggests any technology in my work. Um, and I guess that's my starting place uh, in regard to disrupting the status quo is um, acknowledging and, and being in my discomfort um, because the nature of my work is to ask other people to be in their discomfort um, because of a thing I need to, to talk about that they might not want to hear. So, um, so I, I, I want to I love it, y'all. I want to. It's slow. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I um, don't immediately take to um, all the digital support that is available for storytelling. Um, and one of them is, um, I just didn't think that forums like that were for people like me. <laughs> That's true. I'm pulling a thread through true. people. I'm working here. Um, but it is absolutely true. and. Um, Sorry, I'm going to talk about myself a bunch. I know I told you that. I'm now just saying it again to reassure myself that that's fine, because that's the things I know about. Um, and I can't talk about myself without quoting my mother. So let's start uh, early with that. Um, once upon a time, my, my mother was like, you never know where you are or are supposed to be. Could you just write it in a calendar? 
And I was like, not really, because if I could do that, I'd probably be where I was supposed to be. And I'm just not a calendar person. Like, I'm not an organized person. I don't write down things and then do them. Um, and she reframed it for me, annoying, um, and said, but for people that know where they're supposed to be, they don't need calendars. Like, the calendar is a tool. It's for you. It's for you because you don't know where you're supposed to be. <laughs> please use the tool and show up at the thing that you said you'd be at, please. Um, and, and so, like, I sort of am... Uh, uh, that's a life, life principle for me, a tool that I resist because it seems like it's for other people, um, is often to bring me closer to, um, to achieving the full capacity that comes more naturally to some other people. Um, and there are, there are ways that that can bring me closer to my vision for a project. Slack is not that way. <laughs> but, there, but there are the many ways um, that that could be more useful to me. Um, Majdi Bumatar once said at an impact conference, um, when you write a grant to produce theater, you, uh, if you wrote a grant to produce theater and you had no lighting designer, you'd have to explain why your play happened in the dark. Uh, and that he, it was his feeling at that time, people change, I don't know if it continues to be his feeling, that we should have to explain any time there is not digital arts in our uh, production design. That we should have to explain why there is not production projection in this piece or there is not amplification in this piece. I thrive on disagreeing with Majdi, but it's an intriguing thought. <laughs> it's, it is an intriguing um, question about what is it for and what is it not for. So I primarily uh, create uh, theater and hip hop and it is uh, my relationship with story is that each story calls for its own form. Um, because the, my central body of work is the 54ology in which I attempt to create an artistic response to each nation state on continental Africa, there have, there have to be at least half that many ways of going about it. I can't tell 54 stories in the same shape or they're probably 54 of the same story. Um, and so I try to understand from I, start, I try to move from the story through what I want to achieve with the story into what shape of storytelling is most likely to achieve that outcome or to deliver the aspects of the story that moved me when I first came to understand that story. Um, and so in that way, I'm, I guess I'm forced to engage with all the tools that are available in order to have any hope of achieving a quarter of this lofty goal. Um, So I got to talk to uh, an incredible Saskatoon artist named Joey Tremblay recently, and he spoke about, and he was probably quoting someone else who I cannot attribute this to, I apologize, but he was talking about the way that we've come to conflate the word style with aesthetic. Hmm. So when people say that's not my aesthetic, they really mean that's not my look. Um, and, and Joey broke it down into, um, which I will mangle, an aesthetic is actually an artistic ethic. Mm -hmm. And then having that ethic often results in a style, but that those two things are not the same thing, even though there's maybe a causal relationship between them. Um, and so for me, this comes into the, how the way that I'm telling the story replicates what the story is about. That if, um, if I'm going to be asking um, actresses to come in and perform a story about sexual exploitation of young girls, I, that better be a really safe room to be in. <laughs> I cannot have a replication or a hint of the thing that we are addressing within the process of what we're working on. Um, and in a lot of ways, the ethic that informs the art is not going to be visible on stage, and that's not the thing. That's not the thing that we're working on, because that's about the look. It's about what's actually happening. So um, as much as I've been resistant to working with uh, technology in terms of projection, amplification, and streaming, I recognize that a lot of that is about control and the way that um, if my video didn't play, I would just cry and run out. Um, because I am a child, <laughs> and that is frustrating. I'm going to do that later. It's fine. Are yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stroke the air above your hair because I respect your personal space. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Will that cool. be comforting? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that that is quite horrifying uh, to me, partly because I I 
because um, projection, for example, is a language of the production. And, and a piece dropping out of the show for me is like if an actor started speaking the lines and dropped every fourth word. <laughs> um, I would just be like, curtain down, curtain down. No, the, that's the opposite of the thing I, oh, they're continuing because that's how shows go. That's fine. And I understand that too. And I appreciate that. But I also really <laughs> want to run out there and explain what I meant. And I, I feel like that's one of the places where technology is... Um, where I'm starting to become more capable of being engaged. I have no sense of time. You, you picked that up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're just going to give me a minute. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so, okay, a couple of shows that I've worked on uh, recently. Um, uh, you guys will probably think it's hilarious what I think engagement with digital forms is. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm hilarious and adorable. Um, I uh, recently got to tour with Pandemic Theater, uh, their show The Only Good Indian. Um, which has a projection screen um, that we pop stills up on. It's mostly a stand and deliver lecture uh, performed by a different performer every night. And uh, the stage, the set is a chair and a, a music stand with a laptop on it. And we just walk over to it and go, here's a picture. I'm talking about it. It's gone. I'm talking about another thing now. Um, okay. Awesome for control. Ten <laughs> points for control. Ten points for if it didn't happen, I'm not sure if I should wait ten more seconds because that guy might be about to push the button. No, it's all me. I didn't push the... I did push it. Nothing's <laughs> happening. I'll move on now. Um, that was super duper comfortable um, for me b because of its because of the directness, because of the more steps I am away from the technology, the more a mistake that may or may not be my fault cannot be addressed by me. Um, and so that actually really helped me um, understand and appreciate the way that this visual language that is now accompanying what I'm saying, without me saying this is what you're looking at and this is what it is, um, gave information that I was not actually able to speak and that would have taken longer than a festival slot to talk about that there's so much um, visual coding and signaling that goes on in that kind of material that when it's used in that way as an integral element, if any of those pictures had dropped out, I would have probably kept talking. Yeah, I would have. I always keep talking. But a piece of my story would have been missing. And if that were not the case, I would resent the presence of those visuals um, because I would have felt like I was reading a, a children's book. Um, and then there was like, and then we also used a microphone. I lied, there were three things on stage. And so I'm an MC, I'm a hip hop MC, that's like a rapper, um, <laughs> but, for, but for realsies. It's like a rapper all day, every day. Um, and so I do know, I, I have mic control, I know how to use a mic in the studio, I know how to use a mic on stage. But in the theater, because I'm not a trained actor and I'm self-conscious about that, I do not want to use a mic on stage. It feels like cheating. It feels like refusing to project. And so uh, at first they were like, oh, sometimes use the mic. And I'm like, no, I'm doing it like a real Z's actor. And then I yelled a bunch. And it wasn't very good. Um, and I, I realized that I took for granted the extent to which in a studio, because when you're performing in a concert, you mostly want to be yelling. It's very exciting. Everyone's looking at you in those lights. Um, but when I'm in a studio, I do a lot more um, emotional range vocally because, uh, because I'm able to have that much more control. And um, in the telling of this particular story in The Only Good Indian, I came to understand how that intuitive way of using the mic in the studio was a layer of meaning on the story that was being told, mm. uh, was a layer of communicating uh, intimacy or outrage or reluctance to tell the portion of the story I'm telling. And that, like that specifically, that piece of information, I'm reluctant to tell you the thing I'm gonna tell you, which is often, me standing alone on stage, that is often the subtext. I'm reluctant to communicate this thing, but I feel that it is necessary. Um, I, can, I can give you access to that thing that is uh, a part of my ethic and my aesthetic. It is a part of my ethic to reluctantly get up on a stage and be uncomfortable as shit like I am right now because I feel like I, I, there's something that I want to say to you that is bigger than my feeling of discomfort. And um, that support allows me to do that. Ah. I'm going to move us to the next part of the conversation. Thank you so much. That's way better. <laughs> Everything is awesome. And that was an arc, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thank you. Um, so you said that each story calls for its own form. Yes. And you were talking a little bit about, oh, sorry, it was called The Only Good Indian? Is that, yes. Is that, what about the story of, of The Only Good Indian, whatever the particular story was there, what about it called for that presentation, that laptop chair microphone presentation? Like, what's the connection there between yeah. story or narrative or, you know, topic and that form? Great. Great. I'm now going to answer as if I've given this a lot of thought. Um, it's a collaborative. It's a collaborative piece uh, developed with Javesh Paris, Paris Rim and Tom Arthur Davis. So um, that one's a little bit different than work that I work on on my own, but sure. still I think had really clear reasons for its presentation. One of which is um, removing a veneer of performance from what is very clearly a performance. People came in, they sat down, they looked at us, the lights were on us, we were clearly the ones talking. But at the same time, we were there speaking as ourselves. Um, and while we wanted these uh, other aspects, the visual and the amplification and all the, and the, the uh, there was obviously lighting design that helped um, <clears throat> to isolate moments for us and bump those moments up, we never wanted to be in character. And, uh, there's something slick about being like, you know, I visited my, I visited the place where my mom was born and the place where my mom was born pops up and you yeah. don't look at it and you don't yeah. acknowledge it. And you're not in a relationship with it. This is not like a, a quality judgment about either of those approaches, but it's different. It's a different setup. Yeah. You're communicating something different. Yeah, yeah, so in that setup where a thing pops up and you don't even look at it, the, the subtext of that is, now you're in my mind. Yeah. You can see my, my thinks. And well, in, you're controlling it, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Like I control the universe that you are now in. When yes. I think of a yes. thing, you have it. And in this one, it was very much. I'm now choosing to deliver this thing to you right now. No bones. This is what I'm doing. I'm pressing this button. This thing is up. I'm gonna see it. You're gonna see it. We're all gonna acknowledge that this thing has been brought into the room through these uh, artificial means. And now we're going to move on with the story. So it's like a transparency kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That I think flows through into the, the personal nature of the stories that were being told. Sure. Because very much each of the performers was talking about things I haven't seen them or even myself talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, that personal aspect of, um, of yourself being in the work was very unusually vulnerable. Um, and then I think for me, inside of the performance, um, there was this other character and it was hard to be alone on stage. And so I was able to like, be like, you with me, Picky? Cool, we're both in this together, you well, and me. That's why I had so many slides. Right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, like it yeah. changes, you yeah. have a relationship with a thing yeah. that you're referencing. It's something to lean on, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Has there ever been, in your work, a show where, you know, again, each story calls for its own form. Has there ever been a story that calls for a ton of digital? Like what is the most, you know, immersive, interactive, projection-y, whatever, <laughs> that you've ever had, that a story has called on. Because, I mean, you're doing these 54 stories yeah. in 54 countries. One of those is going to have to call on something super digital, isn't it? Yo, it's coming. It's coming, right? It's coming. I'm moving towards it. Um, I can say a short thing about Sound of the Beast without wanting to yes, dominate yeah. this. That's what I just wanted to talk Thank about, you. Sound of the Beast. I know. Yeah, I thought yeah, you were yeah. getting me there. Um, it's also the thing I ran out of time to talk about, so we worked it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Sound of the Beast, another solo show. I swear I do shows with other people in them, like all the time. But it was another solo show. Yeah, yeah. this one. We're in it together. <laughs> hey, buddy. We're doing all right. Um, so it was, a, it was a solo show using hip-hop spoken word and, and monologue. To um, I was responding to a story of a Tunisian MC named Weldell15 who made a song called Belicia Club meaning the police are dogs, and then got a three-year jail sentence for, uh, for that, performing that song. And then went on the run, zoink, very exciting stuff. And relating that to my experience with um, uh, soft censorship and state control and, and police interactions. And a lot of it is to do with what is suppressed and what remains unspoken. So for that show, um, I wanted to collaborate with a deaf artist um, and get their perspective on all those themes. Um, as well uh, as the struggle to be heard. So we worked with Tamika Bullen, and in, in that particular show, I was incredibly stubborn, and Theater Pass from I was incredibly accommodating um, of the desire to, so Tamika performed some of her own poetry in American Sign Language, and was projected larger than life, so super duper on stage buddy, um, and uh, was captioned. 
and part way, uh, so part of the ethic aesthetic consideration for that show was I, I resisted using um, existing easy or easier ways of captioning that cost money because I wanted to find a way to do this that I could do again on my own, mm -hmm. whether or not I had an accessibility budget. And I wanted to be just damn it about it's too expensive, we can't do it. Yeah. Um, so, of course, then relying heavily on the labor and brains at Theatre Passamurai, we managed to get that done, only to realize then that if to make a word to invite anyone from her community to see her in the show, they would only be receiving her portion of the show because the show itself was not captured. The rest of the show wasn't captured partly or translated. Yeah, yeah. and partly because you could never guess what I was going to say <laughs> for large chunks of it, and partly because I talked this fast. So it's really difficult to, to caption this and then to keep up with me, um, which the team then did. Uh, we ended up doing an, a, a captioning experiment with open, uh, I don't know the right words, open access? Open source? Open source, is that the right thing to say? YouTube, basically. Yeah, we used YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need smarter words for that. Thank you. It's the one I use every day. We yeah. use the YouTubes, yeah, and, and just figured out ways, ways to do it that I think I think the main way we thought of was you not sleeping anymore, Jim. Um, Work. Yeah, now that's just a tradition of life. Oh, gosh. Um, but yeah, so yeah. that's the most technology because, uh, again, in keeping with the themes of the show of, um, of, of amplifying voices, voices, uh, and creating access for communities that are suppressed through, for either practical or political reasons, was really important for... Um, deaf communities to be able to access the show and for to make it to be understood because of course at first I was like this is beautiful don't translate it leave them let them let them suffer like l let the hearing audience wonder what you're saying and she's like oh but I wrote words that I want people to know what they are exactly exactly and I was like yeah 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 no ethic ethics before style right yes exactly. ethics before we, style we just did a piece with Tamika too and and it was such a consideration that like we are not going to use her she's a really the when she performs her She's an incredible performer, and her, you know, her body and her hands and her face, speaking in ASL, are incredibly compelling to watch. But yeah. we're not doing. She's not doing these motions. She's not dancing. It's not a spectacle. She is communicating, yeah. and it's so important not to use her really compelling looking, speaking, as just cool visual material because yeah. that's not what it is. She's right speaking, on. right? So every time that she's speaking, we had to consider exactly how we were captioning and how we're building the piece that, you know, a hearing or a deaf, uh, someone watching it could, uh, could understand it. So, um, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and that's all. And it's so, and you also yeah. don't want to place the captioning in such a way that you miss any of her performance, yeah. Yeah. which is often the case. No. Captioning is often far, far away from the thing that it's meant to be paired. You don't with. want to cover our hands either. Cause yeah. then, like, it, it, there are lots of considerations there, yeah. but when you do it right and you know, the, the producer on my team, Lucius, who made it, who was an incredible, incredible video producer, uh, filmmaker, uh, you know, he really worked with her and he said, I'm going to send this to you, you watch it, can you understand this? There's no sound in, you know, you can't hear the sound of this. Um, you know, is all of your ASL intelligible? Did I, did I shoot this right? Did I frame this right? Wow. So he had to, you know, make sure he was, uh, you know, a little less tight than he normally would be. Don't do all the close-ups on the face, which are beautiful, that he would normally do, because that is not of service to the, hopefully the people who watch this video. Yeah, and then and that's a really perfect example actually when you talk about her facial expressions that like we think of ASL as being a hands language, but yeah. it's actually a body. It's a body language, it's a spine and a face language. And so even like uh, if I if I'm just reading ASL captioning, I'm also missing half oh, yeah. of the messaging. Um, and that's that like sort of challenge of a wholly integrating languages. Mm -hmm. um, the written language and and that segues me over to a question for you, um, which is, uh, so I'm intrigued by the trajectory of the stuff that you create, yeah. which is, it is created for online ability and then moves. And I wonder if you've uh, ever encountered a situation where the, the, the nature of what you need to do to capture or what you're capturing influences the art, affects the art, or, and or slash also too, how does that affect the kind of art you curate for the series? So I'll, the first question I think is that we try never to influence the art because we are not the artists. Like I'm not an artist, um, or not in any way that I would ever share with anyone. But um, <laughs> it's not my job, and it's not what I'm good at. Uh, but you know, we're trying to really shine a spotlight on other artists. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of your question: Does it influence what we curate? 
sadly, of course it does. Yeah. There's lots of really cool art that can't be captured in a four minute video. And, you know, we're always trying to find other ways of talking about those things. We have articles that we can do. You know, we have done live streams. There's other stuff we can do. But yeah, for sure, there's kinds of art that, you know, don't, you can't, if you, if we can't put a good headline on it that really entices you to click on a story, then people aren't going to click on a story. And that art will not get appreciated. So it's absolutely, ah. yeah, it's absolutely a consideration. And, you know, I think in our first couple of years, we chased a lot of easy, quick wins, like really high concept things that you could really explain in the course of a really good tweet. But, you know, there's more to art than a tweet. <laughs> um, and so we are grappling with that all the time. What are the, what are the stories that we're, that we're kind of skipping over because you know, there isn't a great thumbnail image of it, that there, you know, that it just doesn't work that way. Um, I think theater is harder for us to cover, frankly, than, than, you know, visual arts are. For a whole bunch mm -hmm. of reasons, it's hard to do justice to a work in, like, a, you know, a 90-minute work or a two-and-a-half-hour work in four minutes. It's hard to, there's, you know, I'm a union member uh, myself, and I, and I believe in that, but there are lots of you know, difficulties with the way of capturing certain kinds of performances and yeah. rights and technical things about digital versus TV, which I don't want to get into because they're really boring <laughs> and really complicated, and I'm so not a lawyer, but um, which <coughs> also mean that like theater and dance is a little bit harder for us to cover, and it co there's more expense, but it's less the expense than the incredible amount of paperwork that goes with every theater piece we do. <laughs> but we have a commitment to actually doing that stuff. So we are, you know, we are trying to, we're doing more, we're trying to find new ways of doing them. But yeah, to answer your question, there's lots of art that gets left by the wayside, art that I like, art that's really cool that we just don't do. Not right now, yeah. but you know, always, tomorrow's another day, everything will change on the internet, I'll find a new way of doing it, you know. I believe it, in you. Yeah, I'm trying. I. I, we've been talking for a while now. Oh no, but also all these people are, are These here. people have Sorry, lots folks. of smart ideas that are not our ideas. And I don't know, I, I, I wonder if there's any questions about these conversations, whether it's about what either of us do or about this question of digital disruption, um, how it affects any of your work, if anyone has any contributions. Um, just kind of following up on the idea of like the, uh, the medium matching the message and also what you're just saying, Andrew, that I, I kind of disagree with a little bit where <laughs> you you were saying, uh, well, I'm not the artist and like, well, like, or you're the video producers you work with, they, they are they artists, are, they right? Are, they right? Are, and like, so if you're, if you're making, you're making a video about an artist, oh, gotcha. it's a, it's a collaboration inevitably, right? Totally, and, yeah. and the way that you present something as like a video producer, um, you very much have to take into consideration the art of that and how that is actually telling a story, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's so much art in the filmmaking of the people that we, that you know, Lucia is on my team or other other filmmakers who work for that shouldn't have uh, implied otherwise. What I don't want to pretend is art is coming up with a really great Facebook throw. I think there's a lot of skill to it, and we sweat over those details too. <laughs> but I don't want to pretend that that part is the art because it's not. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's in, in the filmmaking, in writing an article, obviously there's an art to it. And Leah Collins, our staff writer, is killer at that. Yeah. yeah. And just one other comment I had was, um, I think I think it's interesting what, what CBC is doing with um, bringing stuff more into the digital realm. Um, my one my one comment is that like I'm I'm getting older now, but I'm still squarely a millennial, and the stuff that I respond to more and more is long form content. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I really click into: um, long podcasts, long videos, uncut interviews. That's the kind of stuff I really like and I seek out. So um, I would just say that I, I hope like CBC is looking at doing like long form stuff too. Yeah, I mean I only went to the corner of CBC, um, but I. I do think you're right. Uh, there is a need for any, like forms with deeper engagement and intimacy uh, that you can really like sink your teeth into. Podcasts are the one that is dominating now. I think I spend half of my waking life listening to a podcast at this point, and 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 yeah, I think it's super important, and I think there's lots of opportunities there. I, um, I really like um, CBC News. Um, the, my app. My CBC yeah, 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 yeah. that has the stories listed and you know from as it happens. And 
Uh, is there a movement to put, to put a CBC Arts similar one for CBC Arts? There won't be an app specifically for CBC Arts, but you will be seeing our content uh, hopefully TBD, but like there, there, there's stuff in the works, yeah, I, that I can't really talk about because it's <laughs> in the works, but yes. Or can it be sunk into that? Into that app? app. Probably not that app, but stay tuned. <laughs> Super secret. <laughs> Um, we're getting a little wrap-up yeah, signal? Wrap up. Okay, uh, well, I want to thank you. you. Thank Jeez. You. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all, and if you guys have any questions or you want to chat, I'm around today. Bonichel, do you want us to see this video that you sent? And you oh, no, I meant for you to run it behind me. I don't, I don't want to waste anybody's time. It's fine. I'll run it behind as we walk out. Ooh. I love that. I love that you're doing that. Post That's it a great to thing Slack. To do with put it on Slack. Yeah, put it on Slack. <laughs> you got me on Slack. Yeah, there you go. So I thank you. We're gonna get in this cable.